P. Thorne, welcome to my studio. So we decided we would make a little video all about the Sur Reactive Load, what it is, how you use it, how to get it connected, and uh, just make it real simple, easy, straightforward to plug in and get to making music as fast as possible. So the reactive load, first off, what is it? Well, it's really, really important to note that you need to connect your tube amplifier to a load of some sort. Usually, traditionally, this would be a speaker cabinet. The speakers would dissipate the energy that your amplifier is producing when you play as sound. If your amplifier is not connected to a speaker cabinet, just imagine that that energy isn't going anywhere now all of a sudden. So you gotta connect it to a load of some sort. So the reactive load accomplishes that. What's different about the reactive load and resistive loads, which is traditionally what's been available on the market, is that the reactive load helps your amplifier respond, feel, and sound as though it was connected to a real speaker cabinet. Your amplifier thinks it's connected to a speaker when it's connected to the reactive load, and it sounds and responds as such. So there's two factors to consider when it comes to guitar speaker sound. Essentially, I think of these things as two different things. There's the impedance and the load that a guitar speaker would place on the guitar amplifier. That affects the tone. And then there's also the characteristic, sophisticated kind of filtering that a guitar speaker does to the guitar sound. Okay, the reactive load accomplishes the first one of these things. Uh, the impedance and placing the load on the amplifier. Adding some speaker simulation, i.e. sort of filtering, to the sound is the second component that you're going to have to add with a different device in order to get a guitar sound that you're sort of familiar with. That sounds like a mic'd up speaker cabinet. So you can take the output out of the reactive load, run it into your recording interface, and then add some impulse responses for speaker simulation. That's like digital speaker simulation, essentially. Uh, and you can do that inside uh, uh, your digital audio workstation, Logic Pro Tools, something like that. Uh, you can also take the output out of the reactive load and run it into an analog cabinet emulator. Sir happens to make one of those. It's called the ACE, the analog cabinet emulator. And uh, that would serve to add that speaker filtration to the sound. So as far as amplifier compatibility goes, the reactive load is rated at 100 watts at 8 ohms. So you want to use the 8 ohm speaker jack output on the back of your amplifier, plug that into the reactive load, and as long as your amp's not more than 100 watts, you're going to be fine. If you're not sure of the output of your amplifier, you should check with your manufacturer and make sure it's not rated for more than 100 watts. Uh, as far as impedance goes, uh, you're going to want to use that 8 ohm output for optimum sound out of your amplifier. If your amplifier has a 4 ohm output, you're going to be okay with that one-way sort of upwards impedance mismatch. So say you've got something like my old Fender Bassman sitting here, it's 4 ohms. I can plug that into the 8 ohm reactive load safely. I do think it's important to note though that I have found that it becomes really, really easy to use your amplifier cranked up and driving really, really hard for extended periods of time when you're using something like the reactive load. You're using it at a nice friendly volume through studio monitors and speaker simulation, and it's easy to forget that you're stressing your amplifier, stressing the tubes, and stressing the output transformer just as hard as if you were plugged into a raging loud speaker cabinet when you're running your amplifier cranked up with the reactive load. So just keep that in mind. It's gonna have an effect on tube life and stressing the components of the amp. Uh, just like it would if you were plugged into real speakers. So you might notice a little bit of physical noise that the reactive load makes when you're playing through it. And if you've got you know, your studio monitors turned down, you're not listening through any speaker simulation, you play some guitar, the reactive load actually makes some physical noise, a little bit of buzzing and that sort of thing. Uh, and also there's a fan in it and that might kick in and create a little bit of whirring noise. That's all totally normal and know that it's mechanical noise of it's the components doing their job in the reactive load and it's not uh, going to get recorded or anything like that. It's not in the audio path. Connecting the reactive load. Okay, the first thing you're going to want to do is use a high quality speaker cable to run from your guitar amplifier speaker output into the speaker input on the reactive load. So that's this one. It's labeled input from amp. Okay, so you're going to want to run a, a cable from the 8 ohm output of your guitar amplifier into input from amp, just like that. 
So there's an optional speaker through jack on the reactive load. If you plug a speaker cable in here and then out to another guitar cabinet, uh, the internal load of the reactive load actually gets disconnected and now whatever speaker cabinet you've got connected serves as the load. So know that your amplifier impedance should be set for whatever the impedance of that cabinet is that you're plugging into. And know that if you plug anything into this jack, you've really got to have the other end connected to a, a guitar speaker because once again you're disconnecting the load portion of the reactive load and that can be dangerous for your amplifier if you don't have a, a speaker connected to that jack. Uh, the DI and line out portion here on the back, which we'll get to in a second here, that always works no matter what. So uh, if you've got another speaker uh, connected to the through jack, you're still going to be able to take advantage of this stuff right here. So let's talk about this for a second. So the DI and line out jacks on the back of the reactive load allow you to connect the unit to an external recording interface or a power amplifier in case you want to reamp and all that kind of good stuff. There's an unbalanced quarter inch output here and there's also a balanced XLR output. So it's important to note that uh, it's not recommended that you use both the unbalanced and balanced outputs at the same time. This is a passive device so you'll notice that there's a level drop and things like that when you're using both of them at the same time and you're not going to get stereo or anything like that out of the reactive load by plugging both of these in so it's best to pick either the balanced or unbalanced line out and use them one at a time. Okay, let's talk about connecting the reactive load to your recording interface using the DI and line output jacks on the back of the unit. Uh, most recording interfaces are going to have a few different types of connectors, so I'm going to uh, address all of them here and try and clear up any confusion you might have. The first thing to note is that if you're using uh, a relatively short cable run, it's fine to use the uh, unbalanced output on the reactive load. Okay, so that's just a standard guitar cable, quarter inch, plugged into the unbalanced output on the other end. To your recording interface, you're going to plug in to the quarter inch high Z input. And if you're using a cable anything less than, say, 15 feet and you use a good high quality cable, you're totally fine. You're going to get all the great tone of your amplifier coming out of the reactive load using that unbalanced connection, and there's absolutely no issues. Okay, now let's talk about the balanced output. So you can plug uh, a, a female XLR jack into this balanced jack and then on the other end plug into your recording interface. The other end of this cable is always going to terminate uh, with uh, some sort of uh, male balanced connector. Now it's either going to be TRS or it's going to be XLR. Generally the mic level uh, inputs on re a recording interface are going to be fixed at minus 30 and we don't really recommend running into those. So XLR to XLR bad. Not the best idea. Uh, the XLR input can affect the tone of the reactive load and it's just not optimum as, as, as far as level goes. You're probably going to have to pad down your recording interface. Uh, it's going to seem like the level is really hot coming out of the reactive load. So what we recommend if you want to run balance is come out of that XLR input and use a, a TRS or quarter inch balance style jack on the other end and run into a quarter inch balance line input on your recording interface. Now, most of those are gonna be switchable between minus 10 or plus four for level. Depending on the amplifier you're using and where you have the output knob on the front of the reactive load set, that's gonna affect whether or not you wanna use that minus 10 or plus four setting. So if you do choose to try connecting the reactive load, uh, XLR to XLR mic level input on your recording interface, just make sure you've got phantom power turned off. I find, generally speaking, for amplifiers anywhere from, say, 15 watts on up to 100 watts, I'm never running the output on the reactive load hotter than about noon. I'm, I'm generally running it for high power amplifiers somewhere around 9 or 10 o'clock, and for lower power amplifiers somewhere around noon, maybe 1 o'clock at the most, and that's all I generally need uh, as far as level coming out of the reactive load. And then beyond that, I will just adjust the minus 10 or plus 4 setting on my recording interface uh, to meet the need. Okay, so I'm plugged into the PT100 amplifier, my signature amplifier, and uh, I'm on the clean channel, uh, channel one, and I'm set up for basically just a, a straight up clean sound, uh, using a Sir Classic, by the way, with single coils, um, and uh, this is a 100 watt amplifier, and I've got it cranked up pretty good right now, so 
I find generally speaking that with 100 watt amps, if I'm running into the high Z input, which I am right now on my UA interface, um, I can get the, the level anywhere, oh, it just depends on the amplifier and the tone, but anywhere from maybe 9, 10 o'clock on up to about noon on the reactive load seems to be um, sufficient to get good level. So I'm going to uh, bring the level up from zero on the reactive load up till about noon. We'll see what that sounds like. Okay, pretty cool. Um, I am right now using the Hi-Z input on my UA Apollo interface, and I've got the, I'm plugged into channel one here, I've got the gain all the way down on the Hi-Z input. I'm not adding any gain. And I'm getting about minus 12 for level. And that is sufficient, by the way. You don't really need to get more of the level than that. Now, if you want to, if you feel like you want to get a little bit more input level, you can either turn up the DI level on the reactive load, or you could just boost the line, uh, sorry, the uh, high Z input gain on channel one on the UA interface. Just about every recording interface will have a software program that comes with it that allows you to do things like control the level of the inputs on the interface, as well as uh, you can mute those inputs and you can control routing and things like that. So uh, for, for universal audio, uh, this is called console, UA console. So here I'm plugged in uh, input one, and this is the high Z input gain. If I want to raise that, I can do that. Okay, so I just brought it up to about, uh, uh, let's say, I guess I'm adding about 4 dB of gain right now. Okay, so I'm recording in Logic right now. I'm using uh, uh, Logic as my uh, my DAW, and I'm uh, plugged into to channel one here, and I'm recording right now using, uh, I'm listening to the channel through a, an impulse response. It's actually three impulse responses blended. And um, so w when you're doing that, you're hearing the sound of the, the speaker simulation because I'm, I'm, I'm listening through the channel in Logic. So if I mute this channel, okay, now I'm not going to hear anything. I could go to UA console over here and open up channel one and the mute button. That's the raw sound with no speaker simulation. Okay, so that's listening to the analog input coming straight out of the reactive load right into my recording interface. Okay, if I open up at the same time the input on channel one in Logic, now you're going to hear some comb filtering or phasing. And in order to really hear this, you'll, we're going to have to use the, the camera mic, but just check out this sound. Kind of filtered, comb filtered, a little phasey, a little bit of the low end and the mids, it's all funny. So the way to make that sound go away is you have to mute one or the other. And because we want to listen to the speaker simulation, because it's pleasing that I've got loaded up in Logic on the channel via an impulse response, I'm going to mute the input on the Apollo console, UA console. OK, so now I'm just hearing the, the, the sound uh, of, the, of the IR. You're hearing reactive load into the interface, running through Logic, and then we're listening through the IR and hearing the resulting sound. Now the advantage to listening to the input uh, in UA console or your, your uh, recording interface's console application, whatever it may be, is that there is zero latency. Okay, but the problem is that there's no speaker sound. So there's not going to be any of that speaker coloration going on uh, that you want. So I find it best to set the buffer as low as I possibly can in my digital audio workstation in Logic. I've got it set to 64 right now. That's, what, that's the buffer setting. And I find at 64, there's almost no latency. I mean, there is a little bit of latency because once again, if I open up both these channels at the same time, you can hear the comb filtering happening. That's because you're hearing the input, which is UA console, a little bit before the output 
of logic and you know it's running through a, a, a analog to digital converter going into the DAW I'm using an IR on that channel and then it's coming back out and you're hearing it a little bit delayed because it's got to go through all that processing and stuff but it's only a few milliseconds it's really minor and I find it's just fine to mute the input in the console application and only listen to the channel in my recording uh, program which is logic <laughs> So now I am plugged into my recording interface using the balanced output coming out of the reactive load running into line 6 TRS uh, quarter inch balanced input on my UA console interface. Uh, I'm just taking a look here at the, uh, the gain. I found that I had to bump up the gain just a little bit using the balanced output uh, to match what I was getting using the high Z or unbalanced output. So. <laughs> It's about minus 15, minus 13 right now. I could turn it up a little bit more on the reactive load, get a little bit more level. And that's about what I was seeing using the unbalanced output. And you'll notice it's the same, uh, same tone. Okay, um, so on my uh, UA Apollo 8P interface, it has continuously variable line level gain on every single input channel, uh, and I can just vary it infinitely. Um, most interfaces on the line inputs, a lot of them anyway, are going to have just a minus 10 or plus 4 switch. So you're basically just going to want to set that to make sure you're not clipping, and also so that you're getting adequate level going into, your, uh, into the interface and into your digital audio workstation. Uh, that's the most important thing, is just making sure that the gain is right there in the sweet spot. You don't need tons of gain. A lot of people think you need to be, you know, getting it up there, you know, minus three, minus two, just before clipping kind of thing. It's not really necessary to set levels like that hot. Uh, so I find, generally speaking, that, you know, down around minus 12, minus 10, maybe, is plenty hot enough, and uh, you'd, you'd be fine with that. Now, if you do decide to use a microphone cable to come out of the balanced output, and you're going to run into a microphone input, once again, keep in mind, most microphone inputs are uh, mic pre-level. It's, it's set at minus 30, so you're probably going to need to pad the input a little bit. It's going to be hot level coming out of the reactive load for a microphone input. Uh, so pat it down so that you're not blowing it up with gain. And also, you're going to want to use a standard microphone cable uh, that's pin too hot. Okay, so I just wanted to talk a little bit about and demonstrate the effect of impulse responses and how different IRs can have such a huge impact on the overall guitar tone. Um, so right now I've got a few different ones dialed up as presets within Mix IR2. This is a uh, impulse response hosting plugin uh, from a company called Redwires. I really like it. I think it's great. It's it's got a great sort of file hierarchy system that it easily allows you to kind of have all your impulse responses loaded up here on the right side of the plugin, and then you can kind of simply pull them into these IR blocks over here. You just grab them, kind of yank them over, and drop them in there, and it makes it incredibly simple to combine impulse responses and to uh, blend them as well. So right now, what I've got dialed up is an impulse response of a Celestion uh, G12H anniversary. It's actually three mics blended. This is one of the Celestion uh, uh, blended IRs. So that's loaded up here in IR block one. And IR block two and three are a stereo pair of room mics. Okay, so the tone that I got dialed up right now is a slightly cr uh, crunchy sort of Americana guitar tone. It sounds like this. <laughs> Okay, sounds really cool with the room mics blended in there. Everything's very real sounding. Might be a little bit bright for some folks. So I also dialed up a Celestion A-Type as another preset. This is an A-Type blended with a, a stereo pair of room mics, and it's a darker microphone position. <laughs> Okay, really apparent the difference in those tones. I'm going to now go to a Celestion uh, Greenback IR. This is a Greenback and a 412, once again blended with a pair of room mics.
Okay, so I've just stored these in this plugin and I can easily just flip between these and, uh, and demonstrate all three different ones. <laughs> Really, really simple to get different guitar sounds, a variety of guitar sounds, and you know, some people are going to like that that slightly darker uh, A-type tone. You can also kind of feel the bloom of the open back cabinet. It feels really good and very realistic. Uh, once again, the uh, G12H. Thinner, a lot brighter sounding, but might be the right thing to cut through a track. And once again, the uh, Greenback in the 412. You know, just three completely different tones. And one of the interesting things is, I'm going to go back to the A type here. One of the interesting things, especially with this plug-in, is that you can easily blend in some room microphones. And I just love the sound of the room mics. If I turn off the close microphone right now, here's just the tone of the room mics. So this is really, really fun to play with these. It makes it hyper-realistic sounding, and it's part of the technology that I just love, using the reactive load with, uh, with, with IRs and being able to blend in these room mics. Because, you know, in the past, I mean, you would have had to have a great room with, you know, a stereo pair of Neumann microphones blended in. You obviously would be playing quite loud, and uh, it's just a, you know, a, a cost-prohibitive and, and, you know, almost impossible thing for most people to be able to accomplish, but not so with reactive load and some great IRs. Once again, I just blended in the close mics there, and now I can turn down those close mics if I want and blend the room in at any level. So that's quite a bit of room mixed in there. It sounds just super cool, really great, and uh, and, and it's just a lot of fun. So, you know, the other thing to, to take note of is the effect that IRs can have on your perception of distortion. So, um, hearing an amplifier uh, it's, uh, through an impulse response that is a, sort of like a close mic'd speaker can be a kind of illuminating and sometimes unpleasant thing for people. Uh, not unlike hearing a, uh, well it's actually exactly the same as hearing a guitar speaker mic'd up for the first time. You know, you don't listen with your ear right on the speaker cabinet down there in the speaker cone and if you did, it, uh, first of all you'd probably go deaf, but second of all it would seem you know, quite unpleasantly bright probably, and you're gonna notice things like distortion and fizz and stuff like that a lot more. Usually we're listening to an amplifier off axis, you know, it's, it's you know, flapping our pant legs, it's pointing not directly at our ears. When you listen with your ear right on the speaker, you know, you notice a lot more things, like I say, like fizz and distortion characteristics. So it's important to note though, that that's how all the great guitar sounds were recorded, really. It's usually close mic or relatively close mic cabinets. So um, if, if you find that a sound um, is a little too hairy or a little too bright for you, just experiment with some different IRs. I'll give you an example here. Um, if I'm on my G12H sound and I'm gonna play just, you know. If I wanted that sound to be relatively undistorted and I'm finding this to be a little hairy and bright and then slightly distorted. It's amazing how you can kind of almost turn that into a relatively clean sound by just switching the IR to a darker one. That's because a lot of that hashy stuff that you hear in the sound that we perceive as distortion and fizz, the more top end you roll off, the more that that is gonna disappear. So, I mean, listen to the sound if I actually bypass the impulse responses. This is just the sound of the raw amplifier now with no speaker sound. I mean, there's a lot of drive and distortion going on in that tone, really, but you don't really perceive it as soon as you roll it off with the Celestion A-type impulse response with a dark mic setting.
Okay, so um, it's, it's just really kind of fascinating to me. Um, so be sure that you play with different IRs and uh, darker IRs, brighter IRs, different speakers in both open back and closed back cabinets. And, uh, and also, of course, don't be afraid to try different amplifier settings because your amplifier tone, as you perceive it um, when you're plugging into a cabinet in the room, can change somewhat drastically when you're plugged into a speaker that's either mic'd up or using a load box and an IR to listen. It's just a much more clinical way to listen to an amplifier. Um, if you want to get a little bit more of that amp in the room feel though, don't be afraid to blend in those room mics. That's what those are there for. And they sound really terrific for getting, a, and you know, they make it feel a little bit more like your amps in the room for sure. <laughs> Thanks for watching this video on the Sur Reactive Load. I would hope I was able to answer any questions that you might have about it. This is a terrific piece of gear that I've been using going on four or five years now. It hasn't let me down. I love the work I've been able to do with this device, and I think it's a real boon for us guitar players. It's just made recording uh, exceptionally easy for me. So. Uh, uh, I, I hope you dig it if you choose to check it out. If you've got any questions on the unit, uh, go to sir.com and there's a customer support link there. Just click contact us, send them an email, and they'll get back to you if you've got any specific questions about it that I wasn't able to answer. And uh, hey, I hope you have a great day. I'm Pete Thorne. See ya.